PBS is not a sponsor of this episode. <laughs> we might have to. Do we have to like ACLU on the um, RBG from the last episode? May she rest in peace. May she rest in peace. All right, let's do this thing. We are so honored to welcome to this episode as our special guest, Rabbi Ruth Abush Magder, PhD, Bechol Lashon's education director and a rabbi in residence who has been involved in Jewish education and leadership for over 30 years. A graduate of Barnard College, she received her doctorate from Yale University, Go Connecticut, and was ordained at Hebrew Union College. The recipient of many grants and fellowships for her work on Jewish food and women's history, in 2006, she was a Jerusalem Fellow at the Mandel Leadership Institute in Jerusalem. A Klal Rabbi Without Borders Fellow, sorry, Rabbi Without Borders Fellow, she is a frequent writer and teacher and has taught and published throughout the world. She edits Bechol Shon's Jewish and publication and we are so honored to welcome her today. So Rabbi Ruth Abush Magder, what would you like us to call you today and why? So um, first of all, just to let you know, my pronouns are she and her. And I go, um, in general, I, I, I move around the world and on social media, et cetera, as Rabbi Ruth. Um, because A. Bushmagder is a really long last name and um, we just decided to go with like first names in the family. And so we go by title and first name. And um, my husband goes by Dr. D. I go by Rabbi Ruth. And among friends, which I consider you guys, we're going to go by with Ruth. But if you want to find me on social media, look for Rabbi Ruth, you'll find me. That's awesome. And it is easy to find you on social media. That's often where I see you. That's great. So Ruth, how and why did you choose to become a rabbi? What was that process like for you? So like Emma, I grew up in Canada, but I'm um, significantly older than she is, which in this case makes a really big difference because when I was growing up in Canada, there were no women rabbis. And honestly, I didn't know that much about the United States. Um, hard for Americans to believe, but when you grew up in Canada, you don't necessarily know what's going on in the US. And um, I grew up wanting to be, my, my, my mom wanted me to be a doctor. She's still sad. Um, medical doctor, but I wanted to be a leader in the Jewish community. I wanted to teach people to love Judaism. I wanted to change the Jewish world and save the Jewish people. I didn't know what that meant exactly, but that's what I wanted to do. And there was no job description for that role. And so I, um, there was, and, and I was really angry at the exclude. I went, I grew up in the Orthodox uh, religiously in the Orthodox world. My family was secular, but I went to Orthodox schools and there was no space for, there was no role that I could imagine for myself. So when I was in elementary, in um, middle school, I heard about a woman named Paula Hyman, who was a, a Jewish historian. And I loved history. I used to walk around. I used to literally read the Encyclopedia Judaica and walk around with, um, David Ben-Gurion's speeches, like a, a big blue book of his speeches. And so I thought, okay, I'll be a Jewish historian. Like if she can do it, if there's this one woman who can do this, I'll do that too. And so that's what I decided I would do. And um, I was really angry and alienated from Judaism for a very long time religiously. And it, when I was graduating college, I, I had the very, very um, special honor of studying with Judith Plasco as an undergraduate and um, having some wonderful professors at Barnard who all said to me, why don't you become a rabbi? And I was like, I don't wanna represent this sexist tradition. I don't want to, I wanna rescue women's voices. I have no interest in this. And people kept saying to me, don't you wanna be a rabbi? Don't you wanna be a rabbi? And I was just like, no, I am not doing that. And I, the way I think about it now, it's kind of like Job, get like um, um, Jonah getting 
calls from God, like, don't come on, let's go, let's do this. And I'm like, no, 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 not doing it. And every year for a number of years, my husband would order the applications for rabbinical school so that they would arrive and I would not fill them out. Um, and then it's a long story, but the, what happened, the, the year before the year, um, in 2000, I was pregnant with my daughter and my mother-in-law of blessed memory got sick and died of cancer a few days after 9-11. And um, we also lost people in our community on 9-11. Uh, it was very personal in many ways. And that combination of the loss of my mother-in-law and that loss helped solidify for me that I didn't want to be a Jewish historian for the rest of my life. I really did actually want to be a rabbi. And so then I went and I finally did it. And honestly, I don't regret it for one day, not ever. Beautiful story. Thank you. That's really incredible. Um, now what a, what a personal reason to become a rabbi that was kind of tapping at you for so long, but you had to wait until every soul, every bit of your soul and every cell in your body was ready. Um, well, and I think that alienation from something that I both loved and hated and felt ex excluded from has, is the through line of my rabbinate, right? Like that is, it's the reason I'm a rabbi and it is the, and it is the guiding light of my rabbinate. So I like, I could be angry at all those wasted years or something of that sort, but instead I've changed, I, I take that. I think a lot of people really have very bad experiences with Judaism growing up. Um, and most of my classmates, you know, grew up happy. I'm a reformed Jew. It's lovely. It's terrific. And I'm like, I was like, I grew up with rabbis who were not necessarily nice people. And, um, I, I just had to have a different vision for myself. It took a long time to, for me to feel like I could embody that role, but so glad I'm here. I I've heard from a number of people and it's a, it's a weird compliment to get um, when they say, you know, adults, um, often baby boomer generation, but sometimes younger, you know, if I had had a rabbi like you growing up, I never would have left Judaism all of these years. Um, and it's, you know, that, that we've lost generations of Jews who could have been involved and who could have been parts of synagogues and leaders in synagogues, um, but who were so turned off because of all kinds of reasons, um, because of leaders who were cruel or, I don't know, you know, we don't know all of the reasons why people were turned away from Judaism. Um, and so, you know, it's a, it's a really good segue into the next question we wanted to ask you, which is, you know, to tell us more about some of the different positions you've held uh, within the Jewish community leading up to where you are now at the Chol Hashon. So my rabbinic jobs are, it's a very small rabbinic um, resume because or let me put it this way. I've had two main jobs and then I've had a million side gigs. Um, my, my rabbinet is full constantly with side gigs. Uh, so I was working right after, after graduation. I did a year fellowship in Israel. And then I came back and I took over my very good friend, Ellen Nemhauser's job at, the, at Hebrew Union College and CCAR working on alumni education. That at some point that ended because of changes in the structure. And um, I had a chance meeting with Diane Tobin, who um, was a mother of another kid in my son's class. And she invited me for lunch and I thought, and I literally went, I swear to you in my sweats and t-shirt because it's San it was in San Francisco. And I just like went to have lunch with this woman. I didn't have too many friends yet. Like we were still new in town. And she said, she offered me, a, by the end of the lunch, she offered me a job and I was not even at the point of looking. Um, and she ran, she founded an organization called Behola Shan working on racial and ethnic diversity in the Jewish community. And what I knew when I started about 
racial and ethnic diversity in the Jewish community was really much zero, like literally zero. What I knew was I cared a great deal about people who were marginalized and wanted to be connected, but felt that they did not have the right or they or their voices weren't center. So that was, a, and I knew that from all my work on feminism. I knew that from my work on my PhD, but I didn't have the diversity education. And in the last, now almost, uh, we're getting on close to 12 years, I really learned a lot. I've like, I've just, it's been transformational. My whole sense of self, my whole sense of what Jewish is, my experience of the world has been radically been transformed by this work. And I couldn't, I couldn't be more happy about that. Wow. Isn't it amazing when those opportunities just come in the right moment and looked for and it changes your whole life? It's incredible. Yeah. And well, plus I have an adventurous spirit, Emma, and I think you, you know something about that. Yeah, lately. <laughs> I didn't until recently, but it's been good. Um, so tell us a little bit more about Bahola Shon and what happens there, what you do there. The Bahola Shon was founded about 21 years ago when um, Diane Tobin and Gary Tobin of Blessed Memory adopted a little boy by the name of Jonah. And Jonah, um, Jonah is black and uh, Gary and Diane are white. And so they were looking around in the Jewish community, having um, strong ties to the Jewish community to see who, what resources there were out there for families like them. And they found that there were very few resources. And so they founded Behol Hashan to celebrate the racial and ethnic diversity of the Jewish community. Um, we, that has been our mission for a long time. We, we for example, we have a camp in uh, California where it's a small camp, but it's primarily Jewish kids of color. And the whole focus is not othering that identity. So that's great. And it's a really special place. We do trainings and education and consulting. I spend a lot of time doing that every day. Um, we, we, do, we publish uh, stories and voices of Jews of color on a regular basis. Uh, right now we have a series of Kabbalat Shabbats that we do online that highlight the diversity of the Jewish community. Uh, we have one coming up this Friday about the Lunar New Year with, uh, starring Rabbi um, Jackie Mates Muchen um, and uh, a whole crew of really talented Asian Jews who are gonna talk about their stories and their experiences. We are going to do one for Loving Day. We're going to do one for, uh, again, for Juneteenth. So we we have created, we're doing a whole bunch of different kinds of things. And um, I'm excited to say that in the last few years, this is a field, for a long time, there were not a lot of voices in this area. Now there are other voices. And that's, to me, that's an exciting piece. Very exciting is uh, to us as an organization. And I think we're going to see a lot of change in the coming year as we have a new executive director, which is uh, the first time we've had a black executive director. Uh, Marcella White Campbell is extraordinary. She is taking on the organization and we are really excited about this new chapter and um, seeing where we go. Wow, thank you for telling us about that. And what, what do people need to know about inclusion and diversity in the Jewish world? Um, so first of all, I would say that this is both historic and new, right? So the Jews have always been a diverse people. We were 12 tribes who wandered in the desert, 12 different tribes, each had their own standard, each had their own place. And they didn't always interact smoothly, even when they landed in the land of Israel, but they found ways to interact. So this, both the problems of diversity and the, the pluses of diversity have always been with the Jewish people, nothing new. Um, and that the Jewish diaspora started in India and Ethiopia, which means that there were black Jews 2000 years before any of my ancestors got to Poland, right? So nobody looked like me in the Bible. I'm, if you're on the radio, you can't see me. I'm a very pale, very white, Ashkenazi, middle-aged, straight white woman. I'm married to a straight man and I have um, two biological children, right? Like, so 
that's me, but that's not the Jewish people. And sometimes people forget the difference between themselves and the rest of the community, right? They think that whoever they are is everybody else, but that's not the truth. We've always been diverse. This And in our current situation, in the we now have adoption, uh, intermarriage, and uh, conversion, which are really exciting pieces that are part of our community today and are creating more and more diversity. And so if 20 years ago, we began to welcome uh, converts into the Jewish community, we uh, in, um, intermarriage and interfaith families, we now have to recognize that inter because multiracial families are growing in number, we also have to recognize that there are more multiracial Jewish families. And we can't ask people of color to leave their, their identities as people of color at the door when they walk into Jewish spaces. It just can't happen. If it does, they will walk right back out. And you know what? Shame on us and not on them. Yeah, absolutely. These are such important conversations and it's, it's really, you know, you're talking about um, African Jews and I, I was surprised and saddened to learn when I moved here that even in our um, South African Jewish communities, there are assumptions that Jews of color are converts. And, um, and in South Africa, that is often true, but in Africa, it's not, not always the case. Um, and even in, in our communities, we're dealing with the assumptions that people are, are holding around um, Jews of color. And uh, it's something we're working on with a lot of intention um, right now. So your comment about that uh, hit me in that, in that this is a thing we're working on even in Africa. So um, we're right there with you. It is a thing. It's a thing that I think we're working on everywhere. And I think that also we have to, we have, to have a, a, an element of compassion for ourselves but also bring with that compassion some striving in and understanding. Jewish survival has, and anti-Semitism has made us parochial because we weren't allowed to have converts for many years. If you did, there were reprisals by the, the church or the, or the um, Muslim authorities, right? So you had to be careful. A, a conversion was not allowed. And, um, and we, so being insular was a survival mechanism. And so many communities have that as a survival mechanism. We have to be aware though, that that, you know, yesterday's attitude does not have to be tomorrow's attitude. And we have to think about how these things um, continue and grow and evolve. That's a really important point. Thank you. So a lot of, oh, Mars, go ahead. You're unmuting. Oh, uh, I'm, I'm reminded of when uh, Black Lives Matter became such a huge topic over the summer and so many Jews were unclear about how to react to it and it became an us and them question and uh how often I had to remind people, and I, I'm in a community in Connecticut that is 98%, not just white, but Christian white. Um, and so, as I've said on the podcast before, the Jews are the diversity. Um, and so, you know, I've had to say, this isn't us and them, this is us. You know, the black community is us. With, you know, there are so many Jews of color um, and we have to protect our own people who are in this community. Um, and so uh, I know I, I you know, um, Emma has questions about this too that she's um, about to lead into, but I know that that was something that was really a profound uh, message that I know I really wanted to keep pushing throughout all of the the protests and the marches that were going on and I don't know how you know how you were processing that as an organization yeah as an organization we um you know on some level it was business as usual right 
this is something we've always done. We continue to do this. Um, while we processed each moment as a, as a crazy moment and like, like this, but if you've been paying attention, um, these stories are not new, right? These are the stories that have existed in the black community. I have um, my own shame about the first, the first time somebody told me about like really detailed story about police harassment. I thought they were making it up. Like I literally, it was a black person and I just assumed that this was not, it, there was no way, the story was so outlandish and didn't resonate with anything in my experience. Um, however, I have learned since that I, what I didn't know was a lot. And so to, on many levels, this was business as usual. Uh, it shined a light on the work we're doing. It gave us more um, possibility and visibility and so we've been working harder and working with more organizations and it's been uh, a, busy, uh, a busy time, but on some level, uh, it's only people who are light-skinned who've been able to not notice, right? That's a privilege. The not noticing is a privilege and the not feeling the urgency is a privilege um, and not, a, not, a, not the reality of the situation. The situation didn't change this summer. The situation became visible in a way that became impossible to ignore. That's what was different. Wow. And did you find that awareness of your, of Bahula Shon and the work that you're doing has increased in relationship to the Black Lives Matter movement and, and things that are, have happened this year? Has that been positive? Yeah, I mean, I think it's really positive. I think that the light that's been shined on this area has been really positive. Um, people are more open to understanding that you're going to have to do more than one session on race to be able to begin to unpack the complexity, right? And again, I think, you know, Marcy, what I heard you say about Connecticut, right, where Jews are the diversity. I live in the South and Jews are not the, the racial diversity, we're the religious diversity. Um, I'm on a board where I am the religious diversity. And one of the reasons I'm on that board is because I represent Judaism. Um, and the, the that piece of this complicates the place Jews have in this conversation about race, right? Our, the Jewish trauma around oppression is real. I don't want to ever say anti-Semitism is real. Um, this is not the oppression Olympics where one of us wins and one of us loses. This is a place where we all lose um, when we're not liberating. And so these are real complicated conversations if you're feeling like an oppressed minority. And so how do we have those conversations? And the Black Lives Matter movement is coming, coming to the forefront at the same time that the white, the white supremacy movement is coming to the forefront. And those things are intertwined and set off buttons and push us all, Jews of any race, in ways that complicate these conversations. And um, as somebody who lives in South Africa, Emma, you know that these, these conversations are situated in the conversations around race that are local. So whatever conversations you're having in your locality are shaped the way we have these conversations within the Jewish community. And they're different in different places. Yeah, it's so true. That's such a, a really interesting and important point. That, that, you know, that the conversation in Connecticut is different than the conversation in Atlanta, which is different than the conversation in Cape Town. Um, and there's also a lot of overlap and similarities where, where our shul has started a race relations reading group as part of our educating ourselves process. Um, and the first book that we're reading together is Cast by Isabella Wilkerson. And... Um, and for those who aren't familiar with it, it, it um, she looks at um, not only the history of, um, of racism in America, but also the caste system in India and um, the um, 
atrocities in Nazi Germany and the, the sort of system of um, dehumanization under the Nazis and, and makes comparisons and contrasts between them. And we had a really, really interesting conversation just the other day about the so sort of how do we live with the and what do we do about the intersectionality of being a people if you are if you are a white Jew you live with the history and the disadvantage of anti-semitism and the holocaust um, and you have white privilege and so in like you were saying Ruth in some in some conversations we are to use her language we are upper caste and in some conversations, we're um, in the untouchable class, and and how do we how do we navigate that so that we're we're coming from the right part of our the right part of our identity at the right time, um, and and to say that you know in this conversation what's appropriate and what's not appropriate you know is this a a, a conversation where it's appropriate to say. I can identify with what you're talking about because of my history in relation to the Holocaust? Or is this a conversation where saying that is inappropriate because I also have white privilege and therefore I can't identify with your experience as a, um, you know, as a black American or as a, a black South African? Um, you know, it, and it's so tricky. It is really tricky and, um surviving and thriving in the United States for many, much of the Jewish community has meant assimilating into the white paradigm, right? So in order to get away from the oppression that we've experienced, we assimilated into the white paradigm. And this is something that goes back to, um, you know, you can see it on the islands in Curacao and Jews, you know, Jews being allowed to live there, um, only if they could identify, they, they, were, they were willing to overlook our Jewishness if we played along with the racial paradigm, right? So you could settle there only if you accepted this paradigm. And so again, it's pitting people against each other when it comes to oppressions and recognizing that my success as a Jew in, in the, the American um, space has to do with my identifying as white. And those are really complicated things to unpack and they're complex intellectually and they're extremely complex emotionally. And, um, you know, I also find as a woman, sometimes I get to like, I've had to deal with sexism. I grew up in Orthodox systems. I was literally told millions of times, really, there's no leadership role for you. And so when I get told, you know, certain things, I get triggered. I get into my defensive mode, right? And it's not even a conscious process. And I can sit like right after I get off the phone and say, oh my God, I can't believe I just did that. Like I was, I was reacting from my emotional place and not from my thinking strategic rabbi, what are we trying to gain from this conversation place? And that happens to all of us all the time. But Judaism has this like really cool idea, right? Every year we have to stand in front of the entire community and say, I have sinned. Because we know you're going to mess up. There is no way to do this world without messing up. And so you have to you have to come back and, and do tshuva. Yeah, Marcy. Oh, well, thank you. Um, <laughs> thank you for calling on me. Um, <laughs> um, similarly to Emma, um, we started a social action book club recently and we chose Color of Love by Mara Gad first, um, which looks inward at the reformed Jewish community. Um, and we chose that because, and the American reformed Jewish community, because of the horror we felt at what happened at the URJ Biennial, um, where she was treated so just... Um, disgustingly by people who call ourselves, you know, liberal and welcoming and inclusive and, you know, all these words we're talking about today. Um, and, and she in her community where she should have felt so included and um, a place that should have been diverse and um, kind to her where she was a, a, a speaker um, and, um you know, standing on one foot 
I think we, we may have spoken about this on an earlier episode where instead of being welcomed, you know, and growing up as a reformed Jew in a reformed congregation and, you know, being super involved in youth group and things like that. Um, but growing up as a, you know, a, a, a black Jew, um, a person of color, which I don't believe she uses that term. I don't think she prefers being called a, a, um, a Jew of color. Um, but she um, instead was treated as if she were um, a, uh, a worker at the hotel. She was not given a, um, she was not given a badge without show, having to show ID and people didn't want to, you know, just assume she belonged at the biennial. Um, it, it was, she was treated terribly um, throughout and, and it was, it was really uh, abominable. Um, so, you know, we have a lot of work to do even as, as the reform movement. Um, so, you know, I, I, I applaud you for doing difficult, difficult work and for helping to shine that light back onto us uh, where we need the work. Yeah, and I, I, I want to be really clear. I often make mistakes and mess things up. I'm not like, I, I may have expertise and experience, but I don't have perfection. And I don't, and again, I'm going back to that like chuva and constantly learning, knowing, going into this, with a, a growth mindset, but knowing you're going to fall and fail. And that's not the way we, we you know, we, we teach mastery, right? I'm gonna teach you your times tables, you'll know them, you'll get them, you'll move on. That's not the way we normally, this, but this is a different kind of learning. And, um, and to bring that kind of mindset into everything that you're doing has forced me to be more compassionate to others, to myself, um, not that I don't, beat myself up sometimes for the things I do wrong um, and to try and, and try constantly. Um, that's one of the privileges about being a rabbi is that's actually built into the job description is mm -hmm. working on self-improvement and whole, reflecting on who you are and working towards something different. Um, right. So those are all the pieces, you know, it's a lot of different pieces. Yeah. And not just being, rabbis, right? But that's, that's also the Jewish imperative, right? Lifelong learning and continued self-betterment and, and not starting from a, a place of assumed perfection or perfection as a goal, um, but from a place of recognition of our, our human flaws and, um, yeah, beautiful. So, you know, and, and also I think I was thinking as you were talking about some of the conversations we had, um, uh, in our, I think Marcy, we were talking about Mara in our conversation about allyship when we did our live, uh, our Facebook live uh, episode during lockdown. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think allyship is one of the things that I've been thinking the most about in 2020, other than 2020, <laughs> which <laughs> occupies a lot of our time. Um, and now we're in 2021, but Yes, we're yet we're still talking about 2020, but allyship is it is hard work, um, and it is it's not just saying you know I accept you. It's really doing the work to educate yourself, and um, and I I think that's I've hit a new level of awareness around that. Um, in the past year and through all these really important conversations that, that I'm tremendously grateful for, but also really feel so much more the call to keep pushing and keep educating um, myself and other people and my community. And um, yeah, um, such important conversations. Yeah, and I think that um the Jewish community often expects other people to be there for us. Mm. And the right, that concept, we know that concept and we have to think about what it means to be there in conversation with people who might push us. It, it's not just enough for us to ask other people to change or bend, but we also have to be willing to do the same. 
and that is a harder thing. Um, and I think that that is about owning our own experience, but also recognizing that we are, our experience is not, um, it's not a question of unique because our experience, the Jewish experience may be unique and maybe not. And that's a longer conversation, but that the experience of having needs that are not met is not unique. Yeah, and also there's, we were talking about rabbinic egos uh, before the episode started. And I also think there's this, there's this um, um, way in which these conversations also require us to, to check our egos and to be able to sort of do that, that seem to work, you know, that withdrawing a little bit of ourself to make space for other people and to be able to say this conversation isn't about me or this conversation isn't about Jews um, or I need to own my biases or my previous mistakes, you know, and. Um, and I'm not going to solve part it. of the work, right? Like that's the other piece. I think that in the reform movement, um, one thing that I've heard, what I, one of the things that I've seen operate just too much is that the only time white Jews encounter people of color is when we are doing tikkun olam, saving work, right? We are improving the world. So if we, the only time you've met people of color is when you're helping them fix a home or the food pantry, etc. then you are teaching one, people of color need white people to save them. Two, the only kind of people of color that come around in Jewish spaces are those in need of saving. Three, that that the only people of color that are out there are in need of us. And so first of all, that reifies the idea of Jews as white, which is not, not okay. And that Jew, like, so what happens when the rabbi shows up and she's black? Right. Then, then like, you're like, that doesn't make any sense. None of my paradigms have any space for that. What happens when the person who walks in the door is got more degrees, more money and more um, clout than you do in the world? It doesn't make any sense. Right. And you, they're not asking you to fix anything. They just want to say Kaddish. Right. All they want, like Mara, God did not want anything other than to share her wisdom share her story. She was, she belonged there more, if, if we take the speaker being invited, more than other people. And yet, right. And so I think that our, like, there is, we're seeing some changes in our movement, but our, our long term and our long standing um, piece, and I've heard this from many rabbis, don't mess with my paradigm. We work well with our black church. If you throw in black Jews, I'm going to have to change my paradigm. Don't, don't mess with that. But that's actually something I've heard many times, a little less um, lately, but I think that we, we have a lot of work um, to do. We have a lot of work to do. Whoa. For, those, for those who are listening and not watching this episode, Marcy's face right now is a full WTF. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, I, I don't even know what to say. I, I, I can't imagine rabbis saying implicitly or explicitly such a thing like don't mess with my paradigm i want blacks to be in their own churches and not in my synagogue as members i can't imagine not that they're saying we don't want them as members they're saying especially somebody in a in a place where you know you were saying majority of your people are white it's a white community this is not my people don't mess with my paradigm because it, it messes with what I have and I'm working really hard with what I have. And I, I recognize that there is work to be done between the Jewish community and the black Christian community or the black Muslim community. I recognize that there's interfaith work that involves issues of class, that involves issues of long-term white standing privilege, right? Those are real issues. They need to be done. But if we don't complicate our paradigm, we will not challenge, we will not open the doors for there to be the black rabbis, the black synagogue presidents, the black educators. We will not, that will not change. If we don't, we will not, not because those people don't want to do those things, but because they won't 
feel comfortable in those jobs because the barriers they're going to have to overcome are going to be too great. And this is a place where, you know, women rabbis, right? Had somebody said to me, my, my, what I didn't tell you when earlier in the, the, the episode, but my, um, my career counseling, like we did one of those tests in high school and mine came back clergy. Um, one of the things was on there was clergy and we all laughed so hard because it, it was just like, you could grow up and be a dog. Like it was like nothing could ever happen. <laughs> Think of what would have happened if the if the the rabbi at my school or somebody at my school had sat me down and said, "Look, this is not something you're thinking about, but you should think about it. You're passionate about Judaism. You're right. We we have a lot of work to do. We need to be people. The, those of us who are white rabbis, and that's the majority of us, have to open doors, create new possibilities, so that the so that some of the that the pipeline of leadership changes. And we have to change, create the change in our own communities. So when those leaders walk in the door and they're the right rabbi for the congregation, they're not just, they know that they're the right rabbi, not because of race, but that is one piece of who they are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and we need to stop inviting black rabbis to come and only talk to us about being black rabbis. No, they're really, they're, many of the people out there are just like talented musicians and thoughtful Torah scholars. And I've seen like, so I've learned so much from our colleagues over the years in so many areas. It's, it's great. I'm also wondering about, you know, how do we support those rabbis? Like just to, to, to like shine a little bit of light on the other side of it those rabbis who are saying, you know, don't mess with my paradigm, you know, how do we, you, you know, I, I think something that people probably don't know about rabbis um, is that it can be really scary to be a rabbi. Um, there's a lot of pressure and there's a lot of um, expectation that we are going to be always on the up and up, you know, a step ahead of everybody morally, a step ahead of everybody in education, a step ahead of everybody in understanding current events, a step ahead of everybody in understanding God, right? And, and we're also just human. So often we're not a step ahead of everybody in all of those areas, um, you know, if we manage to be in one of them. And, 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 <sighs> And now my dogs are barking, so hold on a second. We'll cut this out. They're barking in agreement. They're supporting my, they're supporting my talk about imposter syndrome. Blue, stop. It's okay, Blue. It's enough. I don't even care, but it's, it's enough. It's enough. It's enough. The front door, the front door is closed. Like whatever she's barking at, it's not even something she's seeing. Okay, stop. She feels your your pain, but just to your point, and we will cut this out. That's what's going on, right. like right now, with me doubting so much is like because I'm feeling intellectually yeah, like of your yeah. challenged right now. <laughs> like that's there's so yeah. much self doubt right now. I love you, Mercy. You're amazing. So like so, but but Emma, see, like I don't think of that as imposter syndrome. Right. Well, Just no, but so what I was going to say is not not necessarily imposter syndrome, but I can imagine for those rabbis that that there's a part of it that's like, you know, it's hard enough already to keep all the balls in the air and to be one step ahead of everybody. And now I have to learn a whole new way of thinking about people and understanding people and being accepting and being welcoming and I have to do all this work to educate myself. And, and, and I'm not saying, I'm not saying that it's okay. I'm not saying it's okay. I'm just, I'm just feeling some empathy there, I guess. So that, Emma, that's a great, that's a great comment, right? Like, I think that this is a time of um, extraordinary challenge for all of us. Like there is not a human being I know right now who is not, overly stressed, right? It is what it is. Um, and even if we're in it together, that doesn't mean, and that means that the work of rabbis who do emotional and spiritual support is even harder. So a few things. One is 
Yes, get external help to help you if you don't know the answer. You don't have to be the expert on this. There are thankfully, like I said, many new organizations have come in recently. So if you're not coming to Baholashan, and I welcome you to come to Baholashan, there are lots of wonderful experts out there. The URJ has um, support systems that don't go, you don't have to go at it alone. Two, um, we, we don't, we don't have to get everything right to start making the changes. And we can model that humility in this process that is necessary in this and say, I don't know the answers. We are working on this together. And I don't know the answers because you know what? I'm, I'm in the skin I'm in, and this is not something I grew up with, but I'm excited to learn. Three, and this is really important, is Jewish spaces are uniquely, I truly believe this, uniquely um, situated and Jewish professionals to deal with this, this work. Because this is about identity. This is about oppression. This is about having hard conversations. These are things we already do. There is not a rabbi out there who is not already skilled at having hard conversations. This is not a rabbi out there who's not already committed to lifelong learning. There is not a commute, like you are talking about identity every day with your people on some level and being there really with, in, with deep empathy about the feelings and the challenges that they have coming forward. Those same muscles come and will give you the strength and you can fall on them we're just asking you to expand the area of knowledge and understanding, not asking you to become a different person. We're expanding who you are already and leaning into those strengths. And that's one of the reasons I'm excited about rabbis doing this work. Amen. That is a great place to, <sighs> to yeah. pause. That's a great place to pause. Thank you. Amen. Are you feeling a little better? Because I really believe that. Good. Yeah. Good. Amen. <laughs> and it's actually great. It's a great segue to our Ask the Rabbi segment today, um, which looks at this idea of how we adapt to the changes in leadership. So our Ask the Rabbi segment, our question today comes from, and I hope I am saying her name properly, Stacy. it's either Beagle or Bagel, so I apologize if it is Bagel, um, that's awesome, um, Stacy Bagel Goldstein who writes, while we are in the midst of ever-changing attitudes, women in higher ranks in almost every industry have to deal with bias and prejudice and equality and inequality. With shuls with an older demographic, many aren't used to not only women rabbis, but young ones. So now we're dealing with two other variables. Some congregations with male executive directors have been there so long they dismiss women in leadership have you experienced any difficulties such as these and how have you dealt and overcome them so maybe not in a congregational setting but um you know how have we each but please ruth um begin to the extent that you feel comfortable when you, there is um leadership that's not necessarily comfortable with um, female or younger uh, leadership? How have you mm, wrestled with that personally? Um, <laughs> so I will say that I think I've always been one to speak my mind. Um, I've I've had to learn that sometimes it's not the best. It doesn't always produce the best outcome. Uh, <laughs> but that doesn't usually stop me, which is probably why I'm not a congregational rabbi. Um, I, one of the things that is really interesting to me is two things. It, it's two things that I've heard fairly often. One is people are often surprised that I'm as smart as I am. I'm like, which part of my bio, my work experience? So like they'll invite me to give a speech or a presentation to a board and they're like, wow, you're really smart. I'm like, 
well, did you think you were inviting somebody who didn't know what they were talking about? Because that's just weird. So that's something I hear a lot. I'm Thanks. Like, that's really offensive. Like, is, is I think the appropriate response. Like, which part of Yale PhD did you not like? And like, and, and I, I remember one particularly famous rabbi saying this to me. It was like, "Wow, you really, you really like have a lot of insight. Like, and like, you're paying me for this. You're like." Anyway, it's just, so that's, but the other part is that I'm scary because I'm a truth teller. And, um, and I think that I don't take, I don't, I'm not really great at bullshit. Like I'm just not, uh, which cause again, causes me some problems. Um, and being told that I'm scary is really hard. I mean, that's emotionally very, very hard because I'm not out there being mean or difficult for the sake of being mean or difficult. I am out there really representing what I think are firm truths that go along with our tradition. I am not saying everybody pay a million dollars to me so that we, right, and they're scared because I'm holding a gun to their head. No, I'm saying I'd like you to really think about how much space you're taking up in the public space in this conversation. And I'm not letting people get away with less than living up to their commitments. Mm. And that, that ends up being very, that's very painful. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really powerful to hear you say that and affirming also of my own experiences. I've had people tell me I'm intimidating and somebody once told me I was cold and I'm like, first of all, I'm five feet tall. So, the idea that I'm intimidating is like for me is laughable because I'm like literally scared of tall people. So it's like, and, and I'm also like a cuddly, huggy person. So, you know, and, and I think I imagine there are a lot of our colleagues who are listening to this and also women in other um, professionals, professional spaces where, where they, um, where they are similarly perceived or misperceived, who can really relate to, to what you're saying. Um, and it is painful because it's not, it's not who we are or how we want to be seen. And yet we often have to project energies that are necessary for leadership that when men project those energies, they are... Um, you know, they get standing ovations. And when we project those energies, um, we're told how mean we are. Um, and it doesn't feel nice or fair or okay. And I'm, I'm right there with you. Um, what about you, Marcy? Uh, I had to deal with the young issue quite a bit. Um, I, especially because I skipped a grade. So my first student pulpit, I was 23, you know? And so the congregation that I went to in Florida, God bless them for giving me a chance. Um, they, you know, I, I totally get their, their reluctance to take me on. Um, they're like, how can she possibly relate to anything we have going on in our lives? Um, Luckily, I, you know, we, we had a beautiful relationship, but, um, you know, I was 23, for God's sakes, um, and didn't look young. And I don't, I've never carried myself as young. You know, I, um, m you know, my parents have always said I came out giving sermons, you know, I was bir birthed giving sermons. Um, but uh, I, I understand, I understand the reluctance. Um, and uh you know, I was ordained at 26. There was that same kind of, kind of um, hesitance on the part of different. I've never been in a rush though to to grow older. You know, I will take my time, um, and I'm now in my 40s. But I, um, yeah, I I'm I'm not in a rush. <laughs> so uh, the woman part, it'll be what it'll be. I can't change that. I'm not growing a beard. I'm not growing pace. So you know what? gonna get what you're gonna get 
hashtag this is what a rabbi looks like i also i also really relate to the young the young that was especially in in the first sort of 10 years of my rabbinate that was a huge challenge and you know and like i in the my first year in my congregation in boston my i worked with a cantorial soloist who was tall and bald and so for purim we thought it would be hilarious to be little orphan annie and daddy warbucks um and so my Purim costume was like, I was in pigtails and like a little orphan Annie dress. And it like in hindsight, it was a really bad plan. And people, and, and I met some, a member of the shul that I hadn't met yet because I was still in my first year of being the rabbi and he had never come to shul and decided to come for the first time on Purim. And, um, and we were having a conversation and halfway through the conversation, he realized I was the rabbi. And, and then there was a whole like, wait, you're the rabbi? And then for the whole like two or three other years that I was with that congregation, every time I saw this person, he would tell me the story of how I dressed up like Little Orphan Annie and he still can't believe that I'm the rabbi. So, you know, the joys of it. Struggle. <laughs> struggles. Hashtag the struggle is real. Hashtag. But um, this is what a rabbi looks like. Thank well, you. This is what a rabbi looks like. <laughs> Keep in mind that rabbinates do change over time, right? Like what you can do when you're 20, you know, a 26 year old rabbi is not the same thing as what you do when you're a 52 year old rabbi. Right? Like you have different perspective. And sometimes that perspective is, you know, ages well like a fine wine. And sometimes it gets a little spoiled and out of date. Hard to know where we're going to go. For and sure. that's true. And we've seen that with people who will admit, sometimes they don't, that their rabbinate has become stagnant or inert, right? Mm -hmm. And like need a kick in the tachis to try to do something new. Um, and, you know, <laughs> lifelong contracts and things like that. But um, yeah, hopefully we remain fresh. Fresh. Um I want to circle back for a second, Ruth, your story about um, people being surprised that you're smart, which is so upsetting. I mean, you um, wear glasses, for God's sakes. I know. <laughs> you look incredibly intelligent to me, but not, not that that's how we should be judging people's smarts either. <laughs> penis. But I just want to say... Anybody who thinks rabbis don't have fun together just doesn't know. <laughs> this is this is your moment. Um, no, and actually it speaks to this. So I've, I've been struggling with a question and you are actually the perfect person to maybe help me with it. Okay. So um, yeah. I have a I have a weekly Torah study group and we're all in Zoom where we see each other's faces and um, and most of the people in my Torah study group um, as lunchtime Torah study groups happen to go, are in their um, later stages of life. They're, they're an older crowd. And we have one woman in the group um, who is younger and also um, the only person in the group who's not white. And um, several times, one of the other women in the group likes to to um likes to say to her um how lovely it is that she's in the group and she's so smart and how did she get to be so smart and how does she know all the things she knows and it's so lovely to learn with her but please tell her how she came about this knowledge like and and i'm like sitting there like clenching my teeth thinking like oh this is like very this is like racism happening right now and I don't I don't know how to I don't know how to diffuse it without like I don't I don't want to embarrass either of them um may, probably it's possible that one of them will hear this episode the other one probably won't um I don't want to embarrass either of them um and I and I also don't want it to keep happening so I'd love some advice on uh, yeah, I mean, to, what to do. What do I do? What you're describing, just for listeners who don't know, um, is very typical. 
and is called a microaggression, right? So it's not, it's not like racism, like I'm going to go out and hurt you physically because, right? And it's not even something people maybe even be conscious of. It is uh, the, the idea that people of color are smart is only, the only way you would think that that's surprising is if you don't assume that they're smart. And of course, some people of color are really smart and some are not, but same thing with white people, same people thing with old people, same thing with the young people, right? We come in all levels of smart. Um, although I would argue as an educator that different people are smart in different ways, but that's a whole nother conversation. So questioning what, why and how black people are smart is a, is a very common microaggression and assumption. So when it comes to microaggressions, we have a lot of different steps we can take. So one, you might wanna check in with the person of color and see how are you enjoying the Torah study? I have noticed this. I want to think about the ways in which I can be supportive. And they may actually have, you know, like, oh, I've, I've given up on her. I've, you know, I don't want to. You probably should come with some possible plans to that conversation so that if the person, you know, say, well, because here's what I was thinking. The other thing is, you know, having a check-in with the group that is a general check-in about different norms within the conversation and how do we deal with the norms in this community and just to remember like we assume that everybody who's here who, whoever's in the room should be in the room right like if you're in the room you should be in the room and that's something like in our synagogue right like if you if somebody made the effort to come to synagogue they probably need to be there for some reason. Well, I don't know what the reason is, but like there's something that they're there. So if they're there for Torah study, assume that they're there for a reason and sort of set some ground rules. This is something that we can all do um, <clears throat> for creating uh, communities of belonging that everybody is reminded of the ground rules and, and go through it. You may want to pull over the, the person who's always saying the same thing and say, you know, you've asked this question a lot. I'm just curious, what, what is going on? Tell me about why you're asking. And at going with a, a curiosity mindset to this person might be a really great way to have a conversation. You say, you know, because when I hear that, it makes it almost sound this way, but I know you and that's not what you intended. And they may be horrified, but they may be defensive, right? Like you don't know how they're gonna go, but going in with a huge amount of compassion and a growth mindset for them might help them get to the next stage. Um, but I would definitely do some thinking about it, check in with your person of color, and then think of, and, and have, some, have some possible plans laid out so that you're not coming to the person of color to solve the problem, but you're open to the solution that person might bring if they have one. Thank you so much. That was tremendously helpful. Yeah. And, uh, and then our listeners just got to ask the rabbis for the price of one. So there you go, listeners. Hope that was helpful to more of you than just me. I'll bet it was. Yay, Rabbi Ruth. So that's going to take us into questionnaire Maher. Ruth, these are rapid fire questions, but often people have more to see than just a quick answer. So you do you. <laughs> um, try to keep it short, but you know. Yes. All right. So here are the questions. Are you ready is the first question. I am. I can do. All right. Question, Irma Hare. Here we go. Ruth, who was your first woman rabbi, either in your home synagogue or that you were first aware of? Uh, when I graduated high school in Canada, I went to live in Israel for a year and I took classes at Neve Schechter and I ran into rabbinical students who were women and I must have been the most annoying person they have ever met because I kept asking the women, why are you doing this? Are you sure you want to do this? Why do you like, I probably made them completely crazy. So I have a heavy burden on my heart for all the difficult and nasty conversations I probably had with those women, but it was have an important you, in my journey. Have you, have you considered being a Jewish historian instead? So <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Tell us about a woman that inspires you, Jewish or otherwise. Um, I'm going to go with my friend Wanda Holland Green, uh, Wanda Marie Holland Green, <laughs> who is a head of school at the uh, Hamlin School out in San Francisco. She's a woman of color. She is committed to... Uh, 
a head of school for a girls' school. She is on the board of Columbia University. I have no expectation that I'm ever going to get to her level of accomplishment, but the joy that she brings to everything, the integrity that she brings to everything, and her and her like tireless work ethic um, are an inspiration to me, and um, her commitment to like joyful change in the world is is a real help. She sounds great. She's awesome. What do you think would surprise people to learn about women rabbis? Oh, I skipped one, oh. but we'll go back to it. We are, re we, we laugh a lot together. I mean, we really laugh a lot together. And then fill in the blank, being a woman rabbi is, or women rabbis are? More tired than you realize. <laughs> <laughs> this year i would hey, say actually, probably I'll, always I'll probably say, always yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. um favorite jewish character from a book movie or tv show oh yeah so i'm gonna go with something that you don't know but really was a character that like lives with me fairly frequently comes back and her name is allegra maud goldman and she is from a book um uh called Allegra Maud Goldman. And I, I, I'm, one second, I'm looking up the author. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes, by Edith Connickly, Connickly. And it is a fantastic book. And it was one of the, I read it in college. I didn't really read until I was in college, which is a whole nother conversation. But I read it in college. It's a kid's book. And um, she's just so marvelously irre irreverent and questioning and irrepressible and i just love her will you please send me the name of that book typed out and the author because it sounds like a book i might want to send to some of my i don't know if it's even in print my littles but oh, uh, let me it. it is um oh it's available uh for purchase so yes um and it's very funny because the, the new version makes it look very old-fashioned but if you read this book, it's pretty, it's pretty fun. Amazing. Thank you. Um, a Jewish text, teaching, or value that inspires you or informs your life? Um, I get up every morning and I do, I say Modani, and then I send five gratitude to. <laughs> I, I get up every morning and I say, do say Modani. And um, then I, which means I am grateful for the breath that has been returned to me, which really I am. And then I send a list of five gratitudes to two different friends. And we, we sort of do this accountability thing every day where we um, each do this and um, for each other. And that is, that sustains me. That sustains me. I love that. I might want to steal that with some of my I have an app. I have an app that I use, but there's, you know, you could just do it as a list. But the nice thing is the app keeps the list for you then. Mm, that's cool, too. All right. You're just full of good ideas, Ruth. Thank you. Amazing. I'm smart. <laughs> <laughs> Who would have thought? <laughs> you are smart. Who? Oh. Wow. And scene. And, well, that, and that you talk to women rabbis we're all smart like there's like there's so much wisdom in this group but you know what you took your glasses off and you're still smart <laughs> <laughs> there they are and look all i'm right. wearing contacts today and i'm still smart look at that Me too. i've got long braided side ponytail and i'm still smart it's a, you guys are just you guys are amazing. You're first of all, you came up with this idea for this podcast, which is really smart. Well, well Emma, no, it's true. It was my idea. I'm like pointing back at Marcy that I'm like, no, no, it was my idea. It was Emma's idea. <laughs> yeah. I'm along for the ride. I had a dream. I had a dream it. about you, baby. It's going to come true, baby. I was going to do. I dreamed a dream in days gone by. When hope was high and life worth living, 
Ruth, it's your I turn. I dreamed I'd have a podcast not. with I... a friend. I didn't know what it would be about. Anyway, that's my song. Yeah, if nobody wants me to sing in public. That's not really a thing. Do you? No, no, no. No? Okay. No. That's okay. Marcy and I generally sing enough for most people they, 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 they passed me through the singing for rabbis in in rabbinical school and i mean i'm i'm passable but it really is god gave me many many gifts that was not on the core list it's entertaining though my daughter can really sing Ooh. and i like bring her on sure she's she's uh, oddly she's smart <laughs> Oddly. Oddly, how did that happen? She's a woman. For she's a little girl. How dare she? Be smart? She's young and she's still smart. Whoa! I know. The blown. Ruth, there's one more question. Okay, sorry. Oh, oh, no, sorry. It's, it's Whoa. fine because we totally went off the rails right with you, so no problem. The last question is, what are you thinking about these days? Um, I'm thinking a lot about what it means to be white in the space that works on race. And I don't have any great answers for myself. I just, I just have angst around this. Um, and owning that angst is part of the work. And so, but it's really intense at the moment. And um, yeah, so I'm just thinking about that. Not easy. Right, right there with you. Rabbi Ruth Abush Magder, it has been such a pleasure and joy and learning experience and just, I don't know, even a lot of fun to talk with you today. We are so honored that you accepted our invitation to spend time with us on our podcast and talk about a really, really important issue that we all have to think about and reckon with right now, which is about Jews and inclusion and diversity in a community where way too many of us assume that Ashkenazic Jews who eat gefilte fish and matzo ball soup is all that exists and it's not. And so thank you so much for doing the work that you do and for joining us. And uh, where can our guests find you and find B'chol Shon if they wanna follow up? Yeah, so Bechol Hashan can be found at globaljews.org, and I'm Rabbi Ruth at globaljews.org, or if you want to find me on Twitter or Instagram or um, even, what's it now called? Oh, Clubhouse. I'm Rabbi Ruth, and um, so yes, I two days, so don't ask me I, about it. I can get you an invite to it, but I don't use it. That's what all is I got. Clubhouse? It oh, is Marcy. a whole new platform that I'm trying to understand. But yeah, um, but mainly I'm on Twitter and um, uh, re yeah, I'm always glad to connect with people. And I'm really grateful for the, to the two of you. This was a fantastic conversation for asking really thoughtful questions and for highlighting how much fun we can have while we're being serious. Rabbis can be fun. And smart. Not too often. <laughs> Not too often. <laughs> Thank you so much for being with us. Bye, everybody. Bye now.